This bridge has the longest span of any cable state bridge in the world. It faces challenges that would destroy any ordinary bridge. The water is too deep, the seabed too soft, and an earthquake fault line cuts through the middle. How do you design a bridge to overcome nature's worst? What does it take to build one of the world's mega bridges? This is the Gulf of Corinth in Greece. It is deep, wide, long, great attributes for marine traffic, but a nightmare for traveling by land. The Gulf of Corinth virtually chops Greece in two. The only land route between southern Greece and the rest of Europe is 150 miles east. Bridging the Gulf has been a goal for more than a century. But it was impossible until now. Enter the Rian Antirian Bridge. This colossal bridge is the first ever to cross the Gulf of Corinth. It clears the water by 170 feet, leaving room for the biggest ships. The design of the Rian Antirian Bridge looks deceptively simple. 368 sleek cables, four conical towers, a yellow ribbon of roadway. At night, it glows. But the true brilliance of this bridge is how it overcame the enormous challenges of building here. Challenges so mind-boggling, they stumped engineers for decades. Top of the list, earthquakes. Other bridges have been built in earthquake zones but this bridge must cross an active seismic fault line. And it gets worse. The water here is extremely deep, 200 feet. No bridge anywhere had been built with foundations this deep. It would take a daring plan to overcome these hurdles. April 1996. The only link across the Gulf of Corinth is ferry boat. In perfect weather, it takes 45 minutes. A bridge would reduce that to five. So for decades, the Greek government had solicited new bridge designs. Nothing ordinary could succeed. Yet designers' options are limited. Virtually all bridge designs are based on just four bridge types. Beam arch, suspension, and cable stayed. Choosing the right starting design is crucial. The main criterion is length. The Rian Antirian Bridge must be one and a third miles long. The longest bridges in the world are beam bridges, but this design would be a disaster in the Gulf of Corinth. The flat road spans must be supported from below every few hundred feet. The hundreds of support piers would block major ship traffic. It is a non-starter. An arch bridge can stay clear of huge ship traffic, but to span the Gulf of Corinth would require an arch bridge four times bigger than ever built before. It is too risky. Another dead end. A suspension bridge can leap the farthest of any design. Enormous cables stretch from one shore to the other. Shorter cables hang down from the main cables to hold the roadway. But all these steel cables make suspension bridges expensive. Billions of dollars. Greece cannot afford to build one. Suspension is out. This leaves only one option, a cable stayed design. Here there are no expensive main cables. Instead, the smaller cables hang directly from towers. But no cable stayed bridge ever built could survive the demands of the Gulf of Corinth. The most promising plan comes from a French company, Fincy. 
Vinci's design would attempt to build the world's longest continuously suspended road span. It would require four consecutive towers, something never before tried. A 7,000-foot roadway would hang from the giant towers. This means the towers would bear the entire weight of the bridge. To support this enormous weight, the towers must be planted on extremely solid ground. Researchers probe the sea bottom for bedrock. At 50 feet, there is only silt, sand and clay. 300 feet, still no solid ground. There is no bedrock even 1,500 feet deep. It is a major setback. They cannot build record-setting bridge towers without sturdy ground to support them. During earthquakes, the loose seabed here liquefies. Towers could tilt and destroy the bridge. Vinci's plan will not work. So Vinci engineers return to the drawing board and emerge with an even bolder plan. Their idea? Strengthen the sea bottom by embedding 100-foot long metal cylinders, hundreds of them under each tower. In an earthquake, the pipes should hold the soil firm. It has never been tried. No one even knows exactly how to do it. But the plan is convincing, and Vinci wins the contract. Vinci should be careful what they wish for. Every step brings a new challenge. And the Greek government imposes a big one. The bridge must be completed in five years, or the builders must pay huge financial penalties. Summer 1999. Construction begins. The team's first hurdle? Invent a machine to install the soil reinforcement pipes. Each pipe is a massive 100 feet long, and six feet wide. They need to drive the pipes with precision, so they need a floating platform that is perfectly steady. At normal depth, the builders could use a four-legged barge. The legs extend to the seabed and hold the barge steady against current and waves. That is impossible in the Gulf of Corinth. The seabed is too soft, and the legs would not reach the deep bottom. So engineers here invent another first. They start with a barge called Lisa. Crews remove the legs and replace them with enormous chains. Each chain gets an anchor made of concrete slabs, one and a half million pounds worth. Crews sail the barge into position, lower the anchors, then pull the chains tight now the barge is held rock steady. Having a stationary platform is only the first half of the puzzle. How do you guide the massive pipes through 200 feet of water? With precision. To do it, workers must fit Lisa with an enormous frame. The frame holds a guide tube that moves to exact locations using GPS. To pick up one of the pipes requires a hydraulic hammerhead, big enough to host a poker game. A crane moves the hammerhead and pipe to the guide tube. Even at the surface, it is hard to maneuver the six-foot wide pipe into position. They need to thread it into the guide ring. Now the pipe must be rammed into the seabed. The hydraulic hammer delivers 160,000 pounds of force with each blow. The pipes might strengthen the seabed, but they create a new problem. The towers have to rest on a perfectly flat surface. Builders must add a layer of gravel 10 feet thick. But how do you smooth an enormous pile of gravel that is 200 feet under the water? 
you cannot send people diving at that depth without a lot of care. They cannot stay very long. They cannot wear very much. So you forget it. This is not the way. So the engineers perfect a different system. They use the guide tube. Operators place the bottom of the guide tube exactly where they want the top of the gravel. Then they pour the gravel into the pipe. As they move the pipe, the gravel pours out at the exact level. Sonar scans show the gravel level is accurate to plus or minus two inches. While the seabed is strengthened and leveled, the construction crews tackled their next big challenge, the towers. First, the foundations are built. At shore, they will be huge, larger than any other bridge foundations built before them. One and a half times bigger than a football field. Crews start the foundations by laying down a dense base of steel reinforcement bars. It takes four million pounds of rebar to make the framework for just one tower foundation. Now comes the concrete. Nearly five million gallons of the stuff, but there is a problem. Crews cannot simply pour it on. The dense web of rebar interferes with the flow and creates air pockets. Workers must force huge vibrating wands deep into the wet concrete. This compacts the concrete, making it stronger. At this stage, the foundation looks like an enormous flying saucer. If only it could fly. It has grown too heavy to lift. How can crews move it out of dry dock? Building an earthquake-proof bridge in Greece presents a relentless series of challenges. Virtually every step requires ingenious solutions. The bridge foundation alone weighs a staggering 140 million pounds. Much too heavy to lift it off dry land. So engineers designed this colossal structure with 32 air compartments. Incredibly, it can float. The construction area is flooded and the foundation does float. But to move it takes an engine with 25,000 horsepower. They bring in an icebreaker from Norway. One thing's for sure, people aren't used to seeing an icebreaker in Greek waters. The foundation extends 40 feet underwater. Now comes the real challenge. It needs to grow into a tower, 745 feet tall. But if workers had continued building in the shallow dry dock, the foundation would weigh too much. It would be like an ocean liner stuck on a sandbar. They will have to build the tower while it is floating. The foundation is moored in very deep water. Construction continues. Endless cement trucks, barges of supplies, hundreds of workers. Observers witness commotion but see little progress. The pier never seems to get higher. Because as the pier grows, the whole tower sinks lower under the added weight. Its real height is never visible from ship or shore. May 2001, after a year of construction, the first floating tower is ready for a risky maneuver. Crews must relocate it and sink it into place. The margin for error, only four inches. It takes three tugs to tow this huge structure to position. Now workers slowly add seawater to the 32 compartments in the foundation. 
the enormous unit begins to sink. GPS monitors the positioning. Precise placement on the seabed is critical. That was a bit tricky in our mind. We were a bit uh, <laughs> afraid when we started this operation. The team has good reason to fear this step. Inch by inch, they lower the tower toward the floor of the gulf. Winches on the tugs guide it. Everything goes perfectly until the moment before the foundation touches the bed of gravel. Suddenly, the anchor to one of the tugs slips. The entire foundation moves a foot off target. A foot is three times the acceptable margin for error. To reposition it, they'll have to raise it and begin the process again at great cost of time and money. But engineers come up with an elegant solution. They decide it will be cheaper and faster to move the whole bridge one foot over from where it was supposed to go. Engineers recalculate where to put the remaining three foundations so they will line up with the first. Now the three remaining towers must be placed precisely on the recalculated bridge line. Designers of these towers faced a troubling dilemma. You need to build strong to survive earthquakes, but the more a structure weighs, the more it is impacted by earthquakes. So, to reduce mass, the pier shafts are hollow. Engineers will be able to inspect the hollow piers after the bridge is finished. Access is just under the roadway. Stairs lead down, and down, and down. This level is just the bottom of the pylon head. You take a ladder from here, and that leads to more stairs. Hundreds of them. Even this is not the bottom of the pier. It's just water level. A door provides access for outside inspections and fresh air. After climbing down the hundreds of stairs to reach the water level, engineers still have hundreds more to go. It takes 520 stairs to reach the bottom. So we're at the bottom of the pier. We're 200 feet below the sea level, and below the concrete is the seabed. At these great depths, it is not surprising that the sea tries to force its way in. It is surprising that crickets are hiding down here, somewhere. The doorways lead to empty air chambers inside the widest part of the tower foundation. Critical monitoring devices are mounted on the wall. This one will sound an alarm if it detects water. An accelerometer registers the slightest movements of the tower during earthquakes. To help the towers survive earthquakes, engineers designed another first. The towers are not anchored to the seabed in any way. They simply rest on top of the 10-foot thick gravel. In an earthquake, the towers will slide on top of the gravel. The fiercest shaking will not be transmitted to the other parts of the bridge. Engineers calculate that the towers will be able to slide six feet without compromising the bridge's integrity. That was beneficial to the structure because when sliding, you were in a way cutting off the maximum stress in the structure. When each pier is in place, engineers are ready to build them another 538 feet high and hang 7,000 feet of roadway from them. 
But there is a problem. The finished bridge is going to weigh far more than the towers do now. This added weight will make the foundation sink into the seabed, but no one knows exactly how deep. It could be disastrous for the finished bridge. Engineers must force the towers to settle now by making them millions of pounds heavier. The solution? Seawater. They completely fill each pier. The plan works. The water does cause the foundations to finish settling. Now they will be stable when the bridge is completed. May 2002, two years to deadline. Each tower is a major construction site. Barge after barge delivers concrete. The need is insatiable. The towers will rise from the surface of the water in four distinct sections. Each critically important. Each massively complex. Each an enormous challenge in itself. First, the octagonal pier shaft rises out of the water. It supports the pier head, an inverted pyramid that serves as the base for the four pylon legs. The enormous legs meet at the pylon head. That supports a massive metal bracket where the cables are attached. Pier shaft, pier head, legs, pylon head. The entire bridge depends on their structural integrity. But engineers are about to discover they have overlooked a dangerous weak link. Greece's Gulf of Corinth hides an active seismic fault line. So the design for the new Rian Antirian Bridge must protect it from the inevitable earthquakes. On the bridge towers, the most complex sections are the pier heads. They are 52 feet high, with sides that widen to 130 feet. Construction is well underway when new calculations reveal a dangerous design flaw. An earthquake would subject the narrowest point of the pier head to forces greater than originally anticipated. As designed, it's not strong enough. It is too late to redesign the tower, but not too late to increase the strength of the pyramid. The engineers add rebar, lots of it, more than any other part of the bridge. Inspectors are satisfied the piers are now strong enough. Construction can continue with confidence, for now. The next stage of construction is extremely vulnerable. Building the four-legged pyramid requires extensive precautions. The completed pyramid will be immensely rigid. But while the pyramid is being built, before the four legs converge at the top, the unconnected parts are dangerously weak. In the middle of the strait, we have a fault line. And you have to take into account an earthquake while you are pouring concrete, while you are putting something down with a crane. So this is very difficult. If an earthquake strikes during construction, the legs of the pyramid could move, crumble, and crash into the sea. Most structures need bracing during construction. But here, the contractor takes the idea to a new level. Four massive cross girders brace the legs at four different levels. A total of 16 gigantic cross beams. It is an enormous amount of scaffolding. And it is all temporary. It will be taken down when all the pieces are in place. That is a massive amount of time, money, and materials. But it's like an insurance policy. You pay, then hope you never have to use it. When the towers are finished, one of the four legs will get an elevator.
the journey to the top will still be arduous. The elevator does not go all the way up. It stops where the legs converge. That is the pylon head. And it has one of the most important jobs on this cable stayed bridge. It holds the 100 foot tall blue steel bracket that secures the cables. The entire load of the roadway is anchored here through the cables. When complete, these gargantuan towers rise 538 feet above sea level, almost as tall as the Washington Monument. But there's another 207 feet hidden under the surf. So the monument would be dwarfed if placed beside the entire tower. April 2003. There are 20 months to the deadline. But there is a new urgency. Greece has been chosen to host the 2004 Olympic Games. If the bridge can be ready five months early, the Olympic flame can cross it on its way to Athens. The builders pledge to make it happen. At shore, workers fabricate roadway sections. Assembly starts with massive steel beams. It will take 186 deck sections to build the roadway across the Gulf of Corinth. The deck segments come off the assembly line, ready to be installed on the bridge. They are already fitted with anchors for the cable stays. They even have guardrails for the pedestrian walkway. But first, they need to be carried from shore to the middle of the Gulf. That is easier said than done. Each segment is larger than a tennis court. How do you lift 600,000 pounds into the air, over water? The solution is a specialized floating crane called the tack lift. It can hoist the huge roadway sections 170 feet up, carry them to the bridge, and hold them dead steady while they are installed. The work begins today and every day at dawn. The tack lift picks up a single section of roadway and inches into the gulf. Yesterday's section went right between the tower legs. It cantilevers high over the water waiting for today's section. Now, as the tack lift nears the bridge, one of its Dutch crew relays directions. The captain guides the barge, inch by inch, until the new section approaches the existing roadway. Surveyors use a laser to ensure millimeter accuracy. But there is a problem. The wind is too strong. Even the tack lift cannot hold the span steady. Two hours pass. Finally, workmen can use a huge temporary brace to secure it in place. Another team bolts it to the existing roadway. And for a short time, it becomes the new end of the unfinished highway. Once the crane backs away from the bridge, one cable is attached to each side of the new deck segment. The other end of the cable is anchored to the bracket in the pylon head. Each cable is made of up to 70 strands wrapped in black polyethylene. Each strand is made with exactly seven steel wires, each about the thickness of a chopstick. When the cables are installed, the excess is cut off, and the bare ends get a special coating to prevent rust. It takes 368 cables in all to hold up the 1.4 mile long roadway. That's 25 miles of cable made from 10 million pounds of steel. Summer 2003. There is only a year until the Olympic torch must cross the bridge. But after relatively smooth sailing, builders meet one of their biggest nightmares. 
a major earthquake strikes the unfinished bridge. August 14, 2003. Construction on the enormous Rion Antarian Bridge faces disaster. Seismic shaking reaches a destructive 6.2 on the Richter scale. Towers are still under construction. They are extremely vulnerable. Worse still, the shock hits as builders are installing a new section of roadway. Workers are everywhere. Miraculously, no one is seriously injured. When the dust settles, all the parts of the bridge are still standing. They dodge the bullet and avoid a major catastrophe. All the expensive scaffolding and crossbeams were insurance that more than paid for itself. The unfinished pylons held together. But this was just a warm-up. Engineers know many more earthquakes are coming, so they designed this bridge with a unique safety feature. When you see the bridge from a distance, uh, you really expect that it's going to be sitting on the pylons. And as you can see here, there is no vertical contact between the yellow deck and the concrete. This is the unique thing about this bridge, is that we're suspended to the cable stays, we're suspended to the top. The entire roadway is like one giant swing. In an earthquake, it will be able to move freely, isolated from the most violent shaking. But the very design that protects the bridge in earthquakes makes it vulnerable to high winds. The challenge is how to build a roadway that will not rock in the wind, but will rock during violent earthquakes. To hold the deck in place in bad weather, designers create an innovative system of giant struts. In heavy winds, this main strut holds firm. It does not allow the roadway to move. But when we have something a little bit more extreme, like an earthquake or something which is a load over a certain limit, this is going to run out of action. It's going to break effectively. Inside, a small part is going to break, and the four dampers around it are going to take the movement. The dampers act like shock absorbers on an automobile, only these are enormous. They allow the roadway freedom to move so it is not damaged in a quake, yet keep it from swinging too violently or impacting the towers. And the deck is going to move to side to side. It's going to absorb this energy of the earthquake. And we're not going to have a catastrophic event uh, on, the, on the road or on the, the pylon. Yeah? So we're going to absorb the energy of the earthquake. It's important for the bridge to be able to move. So we need to let the deck move and absorb this movement with the dampers. The dampers will allow the roadway to move more than 16 feet. It would be a rough ride, but the roadway would survive. Another difficult design challenge was predicting the behavior of the cables. All cables vibrate, but too much vibration will damage the bridge. So engineers here incorporated two technologies to help solve potential future problems. An untrained eye could easily overlook them, but they are hiding in plain sight. Built into each cable is a collar. If the cables on the Rion Antirian bridge vibrate excessively, engineers can attach an additional cable that links each collar with the next. It would be like muting a harp by putting a hand on the strings. On the same cable, there is no active seismic fault line here, no excessively deep water. So it was a surprise when the Fred Hartman's cables began to misbehave. And not just a little. The cables were vibrating so much, they were tearing the bridge apart. It was a confusing mystery. The vibrations would come and go, and no one was sure why. In good weather, no problems. In high winds, pouring rain, no problems. But in a mild rain and a mild wind coming from just cables is another device called a strake. It is smaller and even harder to notice than the collars. 
The strake is the spiral lip that runs the length of the white cable sheathing. It looks like it is just decoration, but it plays a key role in the longevity and safety of the bridge. It is a lesson a bridge in Texas learned the hard way. The Fred Hartman Bridge in Baytown, Texas, is not as big as the Rion Antirian Bridge in central Greece. The main span is 1,250 feet, not 7,000. And it spans a river, not the Gulf of Corinth. The right direction, disaster. It took endless observation and wind tunnel tests to figure out why. It turns out that in a mild rain, a tiny stream of rain runs down the cables. The water changes the profile of the cable just enough so the wind sets the cable in motion. Too much wind, the water gets blown off the cable. Too much rain, and the stream of water doesn't form. On the Rian Antirian Bridge, designers do not need to fear mild wind and rain. Here, rainwater cannot run straight down the cables because of the simple raised lip that spirals around each cable. Spring 2004, the new deadline of early August is fast approaching. If the Olympic flame is going to cross the bridge, all the deck segments must be in place. In May, with time to spare, the tack lift transports the last section of roadway from the staging area to the bridge line. The contractor's efforts pay off. Greek authorities see the Olympic flame cross their spectacular new bridge. A week later, the bridge opens to traffic, four months ahead of the original deadline. For the contractor, it means a bonus for opening early. But work on any bridge is never really finished. The builders just switch gears from construction to maintenance. To access the sides and underbelly of the bridge, inspectors use a motorized scaffolding called a gantry. Even with it, checking for rust is a high wire act. We have to inspect all the bridge every year. All the yellow paint has to be inspected from one end to another. It takes about three weeks just to inspect all the yellow, each bolt and each yellow coated area. So here we'd have at least 400 bolts, maybe more as we go closer into the middle of the span. These were all placed and tightened in one day or at least in a shift of eight hours. These need to be checked carefully at the gaps and around them to see if the paintwork is maybe showing some signs of weakness. It's not easy to inspect all the structure while it's being constructed. There's bound to be a few little points which have been left behind despite the thousands and thousands of inspections which have taken place during the construction. After a full day checking yellow, you don't want to see it again, I'll tell you. Maintenance on this superstructure is never routine. Teams need special training, and they need physical strength to access the far reaches of the bridge. From the top of the towers, the view is spectacular. You can see for miles. The sun is shining and the air is calm. Here, working in good weather is not a luxury. It is a safety requirement. Where they will be working, even a small mistake can be deadly. Daredevils are called alpinists. 
as in mountain climbers. The bridge construction company has flown them to Greece from France because they are specialists in bridge maintenance. These alpinists can get to places that barely qualify as places. They anchor their safety line by drilling a single hole where they pound a single bolt to attach a loop to hold their rope. Ten years of this job, and I'm still scared up here. When the alpinists reach the cables, they hang from rollers. If they spot any place that might allow moisture to penetrate the covering around the cable, they dap it with caulk. It's like caulking in a bathroom, only here there is no floor. Generally, the alpinists start at the top and head down. Down is a lot easier than up. They will repeat these trips for months until they have checked all 368 cables. The men can be up here half a day at a time, so each brings a water bottle. If they drink the whole bottle, there is a good chance it will be full again before they come down. Alpinists are just one of the specially trained teams that maintain the bridge. Highly trained scuba divers work on the piers. The strong current makes it a challenge just getting to the pier. The captain races the engine to keep the boat firmly against the pier until the boat can be tied off. The water is so cold. Divers wear watertight dry suits to stay warm. They use liquid dish soap to get a comfortable fit. All this just to drill holes for mounting brackets. be down for hours. Everything that happens on the bridge, day and night, is supervised from the command center behind the toll booths. Operators can see the bridge firsthand. Can you please check for that stop car? Use the 52. But more importantly, they monitor a vast network of cameras and sensors installed all over the bridge. There is too much information to watch all at once, so computers help. They constantly evaluate the cameras and data. When a computer spots potential trouble, it alerts operators. If there is a situation on the bridge, operators can quickly reprogram signs to warn drivers. The Rian and Tyrian bridge faces a combination of challenges that no ordinary bridge could survive. Strong earthquakes, exceptionally deep waters, fast currents, and weak seabeds. And these dangers are piled onto the risks that every megastructure faces. One of the most heart-stopping is lightning. A single bolt can wield a billion volts of electricity and can reach a vaporizing 54,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Not something you want near a bridge. But lightning loves metal and will seek the highest point around. 
so bridges make lightning's A-list. How can the Rhiannon-Tyrian bridge dodge a bullet from Zeus? A bridge's best defense against lightning is a lightning rod. These rods provide a path of least resistance for the lightning. On the Rhiannon-Tyrian bridge, they are connected to metal ribbons that guide lightning bolts around the bridge and down to the sea. An electronic monitor on the tower records each time lightning strikes here. Slide a magnetic key and a little red light will flash once for each strike since the device was installed. 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. 30, Philip. The lightning rods work time and again, but January 27, 2005, a massive bolt scores a direct hit to one of the cables. Operators immediately close the bridge. 40 minutes later, the cable falls to the deck. It has been burned clear through. Losing one cable is not dangerous. This bridge is built so mightily, it can handle losing two, even three cables without a problem. Three days after the freak lightning strike, the damaged cable has been replaced. The bridge is good as new and open for traffic. The quick repair is yet another triumph for this mega structure's builders. It is a source of pride for everyone involved. I was really lucky because I worked during the construction. When I talked about the bridge to my son, that, you know, your daddy built it, you know. And uh, I hear it from him sometimes. He says, let's go to the bridge, my, uh, daddy's bridge, you know. And uh, that makes me really proud. The European Union had designated the Rian Antirian Bridge as one of their most urgent construction projects. Now, this bridge has literally changed the geography of the region. Transportation and commerce have been enhanced across Greece and all Europe. More than a hundred years after Greek Parliament proposed building a bridge here. And only five years after construction began, this bridge enters the record books. The longest cable-stayed suspension bridge in the world. With the longest fully suspended continuous deck, over 7,000 feet. It has the world's largest bridge foundations and the deepest sitting 200 feet under the sea. Innovative engineering allows the Rian and Tyrian bridge to survive where other designs would fail. It stands as one of the world's mega bridges. Technology was used in the ancient world in some unlikely locations. There can be no more unusual place than in a temple. In ancient texts, we have uncovered stunning machines used in temples to create illusion and magic. Statues that cry tears of blood, temples that roar with thunder, and chariots that levitate in the air. All of these temple machines would use sophisticated engineering techniques. These were machines of the gods. Today, we are accustomed to the magnificence of the temples of the ancients and the gods that inhabited them. But it is only recently that the engineering marvels of the temple and its religious ceremonies are becoming known. 
What the ancient manuscripts now reveal might cause us to rethink everything we thought we knew about the ancient world. We know from a whole host of references of the diversity and the range of machines that were invented in the ancient world for all sorts of purposes. The priests of this time were almost like magicians or con work towards re-establishing the site at Lomaco. My house was over there. Her goal is to find the specific animals that she identified and tracked before the war. Yes? Oh, yes. But in the Congo, simmering tensions could threaten to boil over. Without long-term security, the jungles will remain a place to hunt animals rather than study them. But if research can be re-established and the bonobo protected, who knows what revelations they'll offer. The bonobo's world is a kind of time machine, an important rear window on our own history. Bonobos can provide us with insight, not only into the evolution of intelligence, but into our own social nature as well. Now that they've managed to survive the war, we have the chance to discover more about our peace-loving cousins and possibly find out more about ourselves. Nova's last great ape website, meet an expressive bonobo named Kanzi. See a slideshow of bonobo gestures, explore a primate family tree, and more. Find it on pbs.org. Educators and other educational institutions can order this or other NOVA programs for $19.95 plus shipping and handling. Call WGBH Boston Video at 1-800-255-9424.